Identity, motherhood, womanhood, partner, marriage, you name it. The unlearning is where we truly find freedom. Hey everyone, I'm excited. Today I'm actually uh, resharing a podcast conversation that I had with Christy Rocha on her podcast, which is called Sass Says. S A S S S A Y S. Sass says Christy Rocha. This is the interview. She actually interviewed me on her podcast, and we talked everything about self care, motherhood, the toxic culture of parenting and womanhood, and how we burn ourselves out because we were taught to give, 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 give. And Christy actually gets really vulnerable with her own journey through mothering and desires and wanting more. And I wanted to share this podcast with you because I think it's very authentic. It was an authentic conversation that I had with her. She digs deep. You'll even hear her coughing a little bit during it. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm losing my voice. And I am such a huge, huge advocate for vulnerability and authenticity. So let's dive in. How are you? I'm so excited to share that today I'm joined by Heather Chauvin. Heather is a TEDx speaker, author of Dying to Be a Good Mother, and host of the podcast Emotionally Uncomfortable. It has over 6 million downloads. Heather is a leadership coach who helps successful women who are ready to courageously and authentically live, work, and parent on their own terms. This episode is a full-fledged coaching session for me. I coughed, I cried, and I skipped over many questions around Heather's background. So I want to give you a little bit of that here in the intro. Heather started her career as a a social worker, helping adults understand children's behavior. But it wasn't until her stage four cancer diagnosis in 2013 that pushed her to take a deeper stand for change, uncovering how cultural expectations sabotage our dreams. She's been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, Real Simple Magazine, Mind Body Green, Google, and more. When Heather isn't working, you will find her living out what she teaches which may include kayaking, hiking, or anything else that challenges what she believes is possible for herself. And of course, inviting her three children along for the journey. She believes that life is full of opportunities and that it's time to feel alive. So, for warning, I left a lot of what would typically be considered edits into the show because as Heather says, these are the vulnerable moments that women want to hear. I went into the interview anxious and honestly somewhat sick. I had recently lost my voice and regained it enough to keep the interview on the calendar. This conversation sparked a chain of events in my life that I will share more about in the outro once you have some context. In the meantime, I will share that we discuss opting out of toxic motherhood culture, giving ourselves permission to become, how to begin the process of self-discovery and why it matters so much. We talk about how to create systemic change, motherhood as leadership, navigating our relationships as we evolve, strengthening our courage muscles, and so much more. All right, so I won't keep you from it another minute. Here's Heather. Hey, Heather. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Christy, thank you so much. I'm excited for this conversation. <laughs> yes, well, she's let's let's be real. We're excited because I'm about to tell you how you already made me cry today. <laughs> yes, that's what brings me joy. Yes. I was just refreshing myself on who you are and what you're about and your book and your podcast. And I watched the trailer for your book. Mm. And What got me was the whisper, not this, not this. And 
oh, Lord, came the waterworks. You talk about this whisper and women not knowing how to access it. What does that mean? Okay, so first I'm going to tell you this, not this, not this was actually a, I want to say a poem Mm -hmm. that I read from Elizabeth Gilbert. Okay. So the author of Eat, Pray, Love. Mm -hmm. And she had it on like, it was a Facebook status one day. And I read it on my podcast, obviously giving her credit and being like, you know, talking about, it was like a, it was the definition of the whisper, right? It was almost like, oh my gosh, yes, 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 yes. And the feedback, the amount of outreach I got where people were like, yes, 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 not this. Mm -hmm. And I think as women and humans in general, but I'm just, I mainly talk to women. Me too. (laughs) We know what we don't want. Yeah. So what I often hear is, I don't know what I want. I don't know what I want. And I'm like, that's a lie that you're telling yourself because the op- you know the opposite. You know what you don't want. And that whisper, here's my dog barking in the background. His name is Steve. So when he Hi, pisses Steve. me off, I call him Steven. And I was like, Steven, Steven, be quiet. So um, I have a female dog too, but of course she doesn't cause any problems. It's always just the little, the little male yippee one. Um, yeah. <laughs> And he's like, I'm like, Steven, I always yell at him. Um, anywho, so the whisper, the whisper, the whisper, the whisper is that little voice inside of us that we, it's always there. It's always guiding us. But for whatever reason, we're like, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for you. You don't matter. It's not valuable. Um, and she's always guiding us. And then we get to a point in our lives where we're experiencing so much contrast of not this, not this, not this, that our last hope is like, maybe we should actually try to listen to the whisper. Mm -hmm. I know. And, and I could, I can think of, you know, all of the, the things that are, are stopping me, Mm. you know, and, and they sound really legitimate (laughs) and they sound really hard to get through. Um, And I say stopping me, but here I am interviewing you. I have a show, like I'm moving. It just, things just don't seem to be moving fast enough. Um, The progression. And we are just talking about how I've sort of lost my voice and my vision board behind me has go big and, you know, I, I don't know. I didn't really make that connection, which is interesting to me because I normally would, um, you know, like my, I grew up with my mom telling me that if my, if I was congested, it's because I was confused about something or, and one thing she always said was if I had a, a sore throat, it was because there's something I want to say that I'm not. Mm. And now, you know, all right. I, okay. There's things I want to say that I'm not. And oh gosh. <laughs> I'm right. like, I'm like, this interview is going to turn into a coaching <laughs> session. I know. I know. And I, so I, I was so no, but trying to be mindful of that. <laughs> but this is the intimacy that I love yeah. because this is the reality of life. Yeah. Right. And when you're willing to go to those depths of like, being really curious. So what you just said brought up for me when I'm always like, what am I doing? Cause I, first of all, when you're in your own bubble, you're in your life, you can't see it. You're feeling it. You're hearing it. So you surround yourself with people that you trust. It can be people that you physically have paid, but also people that, you know, your circle, your, your next little inner influence of people. You're like, okay, this is my challenge. What am I not be like, where's my blinders? What can't I see? And I just had this conversation with somebody on my team this morning. I'm like, this is how I feel. I don't believe that this is my reality. So tell me what it is. But what I heard you say is you're like, it's not happening fast enough. It's typically not because we're not attracting it. It's because we're holding ourselves back. Yeah. And I'll give you my book as an example. So my book, Dying to Be a Good Mother, 
came out in March of 21. So it's been at the time of this recording, almost a year. I have had the whisper of writing a book for a good 15 years, except part of it was understanding this is a whisper. It's a desire. And then part of it was, do I feel really called to act on it now? Like, you know, when you're like, that feels really far away. It doesn't feel accessible right now, but you're Mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm just going to keep blowing on that whisper. I'm just going to give it more energy. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that, there was a point where I was starting to get angry at myself because I wasn't taking action on that. Mm -hmm. So you can feel it coming. And then all of a sudden you're like, now I'm just annoyed with myself. When you know you're annoyed with yourself, you're getting angry at yourself. You're like, I'm done. I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's when you have avoided the whisper for so long that the universe, whatever you want to say, or, you know, your bigger, your, your beliefs, Mm -hmm. you, it's like, you've now like outgrown that container of space and it's, it's just like a flower or a tree, like in a pot and its roots are just busting through. And it's like, get me out of here. I need more. I need to grow. I need a bigger container of space. And that's how I felt with my book. And I kept telling myself, I don't know how to write. I'm not a writer. I can't find the right people um, to help me, but nor was I taking any action to get the right support. Mm -hmm. And then the second that I did it, I had two, um, I had a decision to make, am I going to go traditional or non-traditional? And then I was using that as the excuse. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, well, here's, here's your choices. Like you have to make a decision. It's not about right or wrong. It's about a decision, be decisive. And the reason why I wasn't making a decision is because I was afraid I was going to fail. So sometimes things move quickly, but we have to like face our fear and we have to strengthen, we have to strengthen those courage muscles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to respond and then I will make this about you. (laughs) But my, I'm putting a lot of weight on, on time. I, I'm doing this. I have a two and a four-year-old and my four-year-old is in school three days a week. My son is home with me all day, every day. And Mm -hmm. so I'm doing this while he naps. And I, I, I usually say after they go to bed, but honestly, by then I'm so tired. I'm so spent that I, if I do do something, it's because it's scheduled. It's an interview. It's, you know, but, but anyway, I absolutely know. I think especially after the last two years of what the world has gone through and what we've gone through as mothers, I'm not meant to be home full time with my children. Mm -hmm. I just know that. And, and for us right now, it's about getting the ducks in the row to afford sending little man (laughs) into daycare because I am, I'm busting at the seams. I'm yelling. I'm frustrated. I'm doing things like when I sit down and talk to my therapist, when I sit and talk to, I have a speaking coach, you know, they remind me of all of the things I actually am doing. You know, they're, they're like, Hey, you launched this challenge. Hey, you have this show. You've upped it to two a week. You've you know, you're doing things, but I feel so stifled by my every day singing blippy songs and making lunches and how many bags of goldfish do you want to eat? Like that I start to lose my mind and I start to lose sight of what I'm doing. And you, you talk a lot about, about, that disconnect from self. And I've, and I've read, and it reminds me of this because, you know, I, I, over the last two years, I've experienced depression, anxiety, things like this, but it's, it's all coming from this disconnect from self. And I don't know, it just, it just doesn't seem like it should be that hard to get back to it. But it, it is when I, it's like when I have a conversation with someone like you, it's like, 
done. We're just making decisions. I feel motivated. And then I wake up the next morning and I'm like back in my reality. And I'm like, what just happened in the last 24 hours? I I I feel this though. Like I, okay, first of all, I was in that very similar situation where I had this strong desire to spend more time, my perception of time with my children. Mm -hmm. Opposite which, problems. <laughs> which was this? Well, no, it wasn't that I didn't want to be with them, but when I was with them, it was like not this, not this, not this. Mm. So I, my, I was telling myself that I want to be with my children more, but what it was is I actually yearned for this connection. Mm. It wasn't about time, but and then also I was saying I want to be with my kids more because. I was so riddled in guilt and fear of failing as a mother that I believed that if they were closer to me, Mm -hmm. then that guilt would go away. So it's almost like numbing pain by eating or like that was my drug of choice was over mothering. Ah. So then when I decided to, so I, I remember having no money, like we had no money and I would have somebody come in the house for like two hours a day, like, and I'd pay her like, 40 bucks or whatever it was. She wasn't a good fit, but whatever (laughs) she came in, she kept him alive and I would be in the other room doing my thing. And I was just like, I would feel guilty because I'm like paying somebody like the mental back and forth. But I will tell you the biggest like relief for me was when I would talk to a woman that's like, I did, I was totally there. I didn't if I had to like make one more sandwich, I would lose it. Like even now, like you got to eat again. Like there's this non-domestic part of me. And then I feel guilty because I feel like I'm I'm missing a piece of like woman Mm -hmm. or mother. And I'm like, you know what? If my version of being a good mother to you means I, I, I'm like alive and well, and we can have intimate conversations and I'm not going to yell at you and you feel loved and safe. You know what? you're going to say my mom sucked at cooking and that's okay. (laughs) Like it's, I can't be great at everything, but I just want you to know that you're loved. Yeah. And how, how old are your boys now? 17, 12 and nine. Wow. Okay. All right. So this is touching on something you talked about in your recent show, this toxic motherhood culture and deciding to opt out. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm obsessed with this, but how, like, how do you opt out? And what, what would you say you're actually opting out of? Yeah. So my podcast was, was called mom is in control. And that was what my target market was saying. I'm a mother. I feel out of control. I want to feel in control. And I'm like, hundred percent. I feel that. And especially with COVID, I just saw this like cry for help of like, we're drowning, we're drowning. And then culturally being like, that's okay. We're all in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's like my human design, my personality, but I'm like, I want to be a part of the conversation of the solution not this repetition over and over and over again. Like, I don't want to be a politician talking about the problems. Mm -hmm. I actually want to be a doer in creating the solution. So I'm like, if I am going to do that, I've gotten to a point in my personal development where I'm like, I just need to become, I'm becoming the exact like role model for all of the women that are behind me or next to me that are like, I just needed permission to do this. And I'm like, I'm going to do it. So if me doing it gives you permission, let's do that. But here's the thing. So I'm, I'm very sensitive. Um, and I've always felt energies, right? So someone walks into a room, you're like, Oh, something's off. Like they're in a bad mood. You can feel that. So I opt out of everything that does not serve me. So when I see something on Instagram and it's a woman saying, you know, on my 10th cup of coffee, this is how you get through motherhood or, you know, sleep. Who needs that? I'm a mother. Um, like all of these cliche memes, I'm like, haha, funny and so toxic for the woman that's watching that who's struggling going, I don't remember the last time I had a good quality sleep. And I'm like, throw Cheerios on the floor, put your kid in a baby gate. If you have to and nap, 
And then when someone is telling you, you know, it just, it's so toxic or, you know, even when you see these perfect photos on Instagram and she writes out what she's going to say on this damn bulletin board. And you're thinking (laughs) you had time to take every, like you had time to put that on the board. Like that probably took you a good hour to put that together and to clean the background behind you to take this perfect photo. But you're telling me you don't have time to go for a walk. You don't have time to take a nap. You don't like, I'm like, wow, like opt out. So I'm here to say mothering, motherhood. Yes, we have a lot of generational baggage of of women's like value in the world, which I think is hilarious because every single human that you meet, it goes back to like, I wonder what their parents were like. And I, the mother wound. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mothering is the greatest leadership role in society. And people value mothers. They're like women and children first. And yet they crap all over them and they don't give them equal rights and benefits and all of that. So I think we're very, very strong and we can hold a lot, but it doesn't mean we need to suffer. And if we actually treated ourselves in a role, according to like, if you were in a corporation and you were at the very top and you were failing, everyone around you'd be like, you need to increase your performance because it's trickling down, right? Like what's going on here? Like you're going to lose your job if the performance doesn't come. Do you need mental wellness? Do you like, what do you need? I mean, if you're in a decent corporation, they might actually care about you. (laughs) But my point is they're going to notice, they're going to give you that feedback. Why don't we do this to women? Yeah. Mothers, like you matter in your house matters. You are not on call 24 seven. And even if you're single and nobody else lives in your house, you're the one who needs to give yourself a break and say, Hey, you're watching TV right now. Like I'm going to put you in the safe container of space and I'm zoning out for 20 minutes with my headphones on. Like I am enough and I'm going to integrate you children, child into my life. You can come for walks with me. You can come to me to the, with the gym. If there's childcare, like all of these things, it's like, what do you need? And then forcing yourself to do that. You have to fight for your joy. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm stopping today's podcast midway to let you know of an amazing opportunity I have coming up. It's called our virtual business retreat. This is something that I created in the middle of COVID when everyone was complaining about not having the time and capacity to work on their next level vision within their business. My clients love it, and so I want to offer it to you. So head on over to heatherchauvin.com forward slash retreat. This is a magical experience that attracts therapists, lawyers, brick and mortar businesses, holistic nutritionists, coaches, consultants, interior designers, artists, and photographers, all women who want to feel alive while growing their businesses and raising their children. This weekend is about connection, leadership, reflecting, and reviewing what's working and what's not working in your business. And we also have a 30-day implementation challenge so you can get the continued support and get quicker results. So again, all you have to do is head on over to heatherchauvin.com forward slash retreat. This happens on April 22nd to the 24th. So hurry up, fill out the form, and we look forward to seeing you there on the inside. Yeah, I know. (laughs) You can see I'm very passionate yes. about this. Yes, I know. And you know what? I, I like what you said uh, going back about being part of the solution because something that I've said a lot on the show is, you know, women are, we're really good at talking ourselves in circles. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people out there now. There's a lot of women on social media that have podcasts. I talk to them and they're, they're excellent and they have really great things to say. But if we just keep going back and forth with each other, it's, it's not enough. There needs to be action. There needs to be systemic change throughout our society. And I'm not the person to do it, but 
there, someone has to be <laughs> like, I don't but know. Here's the, here's the thing with systemic change. Like um, there's a few people, the ones, the people that I follow, I actually don't follow a lot of people, but the fee- people that I follow currently that I respect mm-hmm. are the people that are like, we all know the problem. I'm literally part of the solution Mm -hmm. and systemic change in anything comes from people opting out of the system, Mm -hmm. like giving pushback to the system. Starting with the individual. hundred percent. So you, you are a contributing factor to the system. Even if it's in your home, Mm -hmm. you're taking a stand for women who are like, I'm at home And this is not sustainable. And I have to opt out of this cultural system of, and I'm using air quotes, Mm -hmm. stay at home mom, like legit house manager, life manager. Mm -hmm. And I need to rework my job description and also how I, I'm going to say pay myself, but like value myself for the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And what that looks like, and also our children, like, let's talk about childcare and affording childcare. I mean, one, sometimes we can afford it, but there's just a lot of guilt around actually investing in it. Mm-hmm. Two, we don't, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Maybe you're like, I'm going to try one day and it could be with somebody else. And then we'll like, just slowly integrate into that. Um, like dollar for dollar. Like mm-hmm. I remember I'm like, if I make a hundred dollars, then I can afford <laughs> somebody to clean my house for a hundred dollars yeah. and then I'll be working, but they're cleaning. And it's, we just got to <laughs> like push our mental boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. It's reminding me of like, of when you hear someone say, or just whatever out there, it's like, just because it always was, doesn't mean it has to stay that way, you know? Yeah. And, and it's reminding me of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we talk, so we were talking quite a bit about what we're opting out of. Is it appropriate to ask what you opt into? Mm -hmm. What is like, what does it look like on the daily for you? So first of all, I mean, you learn a lot about yourself as an individual. I think every single human is designed uniquely and you have to find what works for you and it's not going to work for everyone. But I have, I now believe, I mean, if we believe feeling like crap equals good mothering, then our brain tries to find things, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm fatigued. I'm being good. Like we're not taking ownership. Mm -hmm. I now believe that the better I feel, um, that equals success. Mm -hmm. So I opt in to anything that allows me to feel alive, like in my business, for example, we were growing rapidly. I understand that there's moments of like, not this, I don't like this. It doesn't feel good, but it's temporary. It's a, it's a, it's a, what do you call it? Growing pain. Mm -hmm. It's a contraction. It's, it's not my business model. It's not the whole thing. Right. So I'm like, this is not sustainable. Um, you know, I'll handle it for a month or two, but after that I'm done. I'm like, how can I, I'm always focused on how can I, how can I, how can I, how can I? So movement is big for me. And I will tell you, I do not identify as somebody who loves working (laughs) out. Um, but last in the last two years, I experienced the contrast of like losing my mind and I had to figure out movement, but not from this diet culture place, from a place of like feeling really strong and healthy in my body and nutrition as well. And so I invested in that. And then I'm still working on seeping that into my identity and how people see me and how I see myself in that way are different. Um, I love learning new skills, but like when it comes to raising my children, I'm always like, what do I want? What does my, like my husband want? What do the kids want? And then how can we create this concoction together? Not what does everyone else want to do? Okay, fine. I'll just follow along. It's like, what brings you joy? What brings you joy? And sometimes you have to test, you know, the kids when they don't want to do it. And you're like, no, we're going for a hike. We're doing this thing. So I opt into adventure. I opt into anything that makes me feel really good. Um, I opt into spending time with people who bring me joy. I've actually gotten to the point where I'm like, someone's like, do you want to go for coffee? Do you want to go for a walk? And I'm like, 
every time I'm with you, I just feel a little like, ugh. <laughs> so I'm like, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Like I'm very, I'm, I'm very boundary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's funny you said, um, you know, in, instead of saying, what does everyone else want and want and I'll go with it. I actually also, if, what comes to mind to me is the opposite is that I'm feel like I'm, I'm often pushed to a point where I have to go, I have to like lay a law down and that never works. And so I, I, I really like that for me, for the reminder of it has to incorporate everyone in the house. And, and I wonder about that too. So going, so, you know, deciding say, okay, I'm going to opt out of toxic motherhood culture and I'm going to prioritize what makes me feel alive. I, I, I hesitate to ask this, but I need to. Where does your husband sit with that? How was that received? And how did you guys work through that? I love this question. (laughs) I get it a lot. Um, So your first, I will come back to the husband thing, but your first thing of like, I have to lay down the law Mm -hmm. means you're in the red zone. Yeah. I'm I'm beyond. Yeah. And there's something that happened before the red where you let the boundary slide. (sighs) Okay. All right. You're calling me out. (laughs) You you asked for it. So there's the yellow zone, what I call the yellow zone. (laughs) And, you know, it's like, oh, come on, come on, come on. And like, I just leave the room. Right. So my, my teenager does this to me a lot. Like, Hey, can I do this? Like the kids do it all the time. Hey, can I have this? Can I have this? Can I have this? And I'm like, no. And then, you know, they come and push and push. And I literally look and I'm like, I don't repeat myself twice. (laughs) And then I just, and then they say it again. And I look and I'm like, (laughs) and they're like, and I just, I opt out. I opt out. Disengage. So, I will tell you with my husband, I've had this conversation many times because women really are challenged with it. Um, I ask him often, like people wonder why, or they're like, how do you get your husband to support you? Or how do you like get him to like do more around the house or whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, he looks at me and he goes, Oh, we wouldn't be married. (laughs) <laughs> like we wouldn't be married if that, like, he's like, that's just, he's like, I already know that wouldn't be your thing. And so I think part of it is when we are becoming different people, like our identity, we have to be patient with the people that are energetically attached to us. Mm-hmm. But I, and expect pushback, Yeah. but you also deserve to be heard and understand that you're not just going to say it once. <laughs> So an example, a lot of clients will be, will say things to me like, oh, I just, like I had a woman the other day say, oh, I just need to get, you know, everyone on board and bubble. I was like, you don't need to get anybody on board. Like what happens if you get COVID and you are out of commission for a week or two and you're stuck in your room, who's going to do all the other things? Mm -hmm. Someone's going to figure it out and everyone's going to survive. My point is, why do you, it's like, why are we, we have to take ownership that we're trying to control some things. Like, what do you want? Come up with a, like, uh, Hey, I mean, we would have weekly meetings Mm -hmm. and I would be so angry and resentful in those weekly meetings. But what I had to do was come back to my discernment over and over and over again of who do I want to be? How do I want to feel? And then I would come with the story of like, why do I always have to be the responsible one mm-hmm. in my head? And I'm like, that's my mother's story. That's my like childhood story. <laughs> I got to heal that. That has nothing to do with my husband. So I'd come to this meeting and I would say, here's what my week looks like. Okay. There's all of these other things on the to-do list. Like I'm overwhelmed. Can you help me? what can you take off this list? And they, they're like, Oh, I'll just, I'll take the list for you. You're like, no, 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 no. Like what's one thing. And then they would take the one thing and I would write it down. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. (laughs) And then I'd write it down. And the next day I would say, Hey, just curious. Did you make that doctor's appointment? And he's like, no. 
I'm like, cool. When are you going to make it by? And I would, I would track it. Okay. Friday. Awesome. I'll ask you on Friday. And I had to teach him yeah. how to support me. It's not that they don't want to help. Mm-hmm. This goes back to how they were parented. Yeah. And it sounds awful, but they're not our children. And we need to stop treating them like that. Yeah. Yeah. I just finished reading uh, Anne Helen Peterson's Can't Even, How mm-hmm. Millennials Became the Burnout Generation. And she was talking about... Um, this this dynamic and she's she referenced a book and she's talking about how you know men will say like my a guy a husband will say oh my wife will come in and say can't you just vacuum while you're watching the game and the so he'll vacuum but she'll but he'll he won't actually do it right like he'll just like do it to say he did it but not fully do it well and then he'll just decide well uh, she came in and said I didn't do it well enough. So I'm just not going to do it anymore. And, and she made the connection of like, if you did that at work, if you're, if like women are the supervisors of this, of the house. And if your supervisor came to you and said, you didn't do the best job at that. Would you just say, well, then I'm just not going to do it anymore. (laughs) Like we put our, we've like women have been put in this position to, to run the house Mm -hmm. and to be the boss but the spouses, it's like they want to be told what to do f- and they're the employee. But then when they don't do it right, it's like they just opt out to use I, that. And I have that on the brain because you've said it. But it's like, well, just never mind. And, that, and this is the only dynamic that that would actually work in to some extent. And but then yeah. what happens is the woman overcompensates. Yeah. And she's like, fine, I'll just do it myself then. Yeah. And then she adds that additional task to her plate instead of saying, first of all, women can multitask. Like our brains are actually designed to multitask. Not that it's good, but we can actually do it. I don't mm-hmm. think it's healthy to multitask, but we can. Mm-hmm. Like I could be doing something and talking to my husband. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm cutting cheese. <laughs> Wait until I'm done cutting cheese and then we can have this conversation. (laughs) So if he's watching a game, Mm -hmm. there's no way he's vacuuming at the same time where we, we are designed to do that. Mm -hmm. So my point is one, it's a brain thing. And two, you, it's like, (laughs) how can we have a conversation (laughs) after and say, Hey, let's like, I see, I asked you to vacuum. I see there was no energy or effort into that. Mm. Like, do you want to do it again and again and again and again? Like, how can we? And, right. and I always, I just don't want to be angry and resentful in my relationship. So I'm like, what baggage am I bringing to yeah. this conversation? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that too. I mean, I've done a lot of work in figuring out how much of the frustration in the dynamic is the assumptions I'm putting on, on it. Like, Oh, he's not doing that because it's like, no, it just doesn't occur to him, (laughs) you know? And, and I think what you're saying about almost teaching, right? It's a lot of work and that in itself is frustrating. I think that the end goal of what you're talking about is, is beneficial, right? Like now that the, all the boys in your house, all the men in your house kind of know how things are. And if they weren't this way, then you wouldn't be married. But to get to that point is a ton of work. Mm-hmm. And that's still even on us to do. Like that, I'll do it because the end goal is what I want. But it's, that's frustrating as heck to me. Oh, 100%. And I'll tell you I'm on the other side of that. <coughs> so my husband and I did a complete role reversal. So he was the breadwinner. And then I kind of stayed at home. I was in school, had part-time jobs, you know, paid the like vacation fund, And then it flipped. And now my husband works within the company, Mm -hmm. like the company I built, Mm -hmm. and he does more of the domestic roles. Mm -hmm. So we're actually experiencing the opposite. Mm -hmm. You want me to do it again? (laughs) Why don't we just like laugh hysterically and be like, it doesn't matter how much we try to plan anything in life. This is what happens. Oh, God. Okay. All right. So, Heather. Assuming, wait, I'm assuming you're actually recording this. I can't see anything. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm it's going. Freaks me out because I usually see like a little record button. I know, I know. And I, but I, I'm like crazy about it. It's there. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So you're experiencing the opposite. You've done a role reversal. Your husband was the breadwinner. And now he's actually working as part of your company. 100%. So I had an identity crisis Mm. because I was actually letting go of some of those domesticated roles and also the woman, and I'm using air quotes, um, responsibilities Mm -hmm. of getting the kids out of bed in the morning, getting them off to school, um, making them breakfast. And I was actually finding this like, lack of purpose, like lack of fulfillment in the nurturer in me. And so I have to balance that because, you know, we want to co-parent or some people are in, you know, separated families. And you're like, what is that within me that's trying to find that fulfillment? And yet we know that we need more space and capacity. And it's always this like this tug, right? Mm -hmm. This tug, but it, it took a really long time, but I will tell you now, my husband's like, put your dish in the dishwasher, (laughs) pick up your clothes. (laughs) To you, you mean? To me. Yeah. (laughs) And I will tell you part of the reason why, first of all, I've never been like a meticulously clean person. Mm -hmm. Of course, when I had to do it, I was like, whatever. So I've gone back into like my teen like brain, which is like, I have to consciously be like, okay, these dishes are dirty, put the bowl (laughs) in the dishwasher because he'll clean up after me, like legit right after me. And so when women are talking about this, I feel guilty Mm. because I'm like, I experienced the opposite, but I will also tell you that I've told him, stop enabling me, (laughs) stop enabling me. Don't do it for me. And he's like, what, what do you mean? You want me to call you out? I said, yes. And I'm like, this is exactly why women get mad at their partners because they're doing it for them. I'm emotional about it. That's the thing. Like, I'm like, I have a tickle in my throat. I'm not trying to like make more of it than it is. But like, I've literally been anxious about this all day. Mm. And I can feel in my stomach that it's subsided. But it's like. Like, I'm going to cry now. Like, it's like, I'm just like, uh, I feel like so stuck, you know, I'm just, and everything you're saying, and I, I'm, uh, <laughs> it's not surprising to me that you're coughing. Like, I'm not kidding. You're, it's just, to me, I call it an emotional poop. You're, it's coming, <laughs> it's coming up and out. Like the body is like let it out, let it out, let it out. I just had a client that was like, I've never been sick so many times in my life than joining this program. And she's like a health coach. And I was like, it's coming up and out. Like your body is releasing it. Do you know what's so funny is that I went to the doctor about a month ago because I've been getting sick so much. And some of it is right. I have toddlers, they're in daycare. They come home with something new every five seconds. But like none of my kids are sick right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm also going, shouldn't my immune system be a little stronger than theirs? <laughs> like, why am I catching everything they do? Oh, okay. Oh, my gosh. I'm not, I, I probably won't edit much of this out. <laughs> Good. I, these are the conversations <clears throat> that people need to hear. The reality of transformation and life. Because what they see on the other side of that is like, oh, my gosh. How did she get there? And yeah. it's like. She had to like go through a birth canal that was not comfortable. I know. And you know what I think part of it for me is right now is sort of, you know, and being a, a viewer of, of you and your work and, and your show and everything, it's like, it feels so far away. Mm. Like where you are and where you're sitting and everything you're saying, like feels so far away for me right now. <laughs> mm, and I've, it's like, I've come so far, mm-hmm. but I'm also really like, I think coming to terms with like how much 
I've put on other people and I've put on my husband and my kids as being the reason why I'm I feel this way and it it's there's reality of that but there's also just me not saying things need to change and really like like when you when you said you know your husband saying we just want to be married. You said it casually, but that's so deep. Like, that is such a deep understanding between two people. And uh, to really actually picture myself sitting down with my husband, who is going to listen to this, and I love you so much. <laughs> like, to sit down and be like, this has to change or we're not married anymore. Like, that is, that's so uncomfortable. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's, 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 it's there. Like it's, it's just because, and I don't think it's um, just in my, in my case, it's not that he don't, he wants nothing more than for me to be happy, but I'm like, I'm, I'm enabling my unhappiness. (laughs) Nine out of 10 times when I'm hearing these stories, it's, the woman saying the crazy thing is, is he will support me. He will do anything for me. And that other situation where it appears that the partner is not supportive, Mm -hmm. what they're actually experiencing is a partner who's terrified to lose them. Mm. And so it, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it goes both ways, but I think you may have a fear that you're going to lose your partner if you grow because I remember being there. Yeah. Yeah, and and I, I like I mean I I wouldn't have had the clarity to put it that way. But yeah, and that's I but that's is certainly where the question of where did your husband fit into this? How did he feel? How did you get to that point because it that's that's scary for me right now. You know, like I, 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 I want to be, it's, it's hard to, to rock such a big boat, you know, like it's, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have anything clear to say on it because I am not clear on it yet for me, but and I don't think it has to be, I think we do very well with like this all or nothing. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, like you wake up one day and look around and be like, why is there so much, why is there so many toys around the house? Yeah. Well, they didn't just explode that way. You don't (laughs) notice these things. It's one degree, right? Right. So you're just like, you know what? I'm going to commit to doing this small thing for myself for 30 days. Mm -hmm. It's going to be mildly, I call it emotionally uncomfortable, right? For Mm -hmm. you. And you're like, ah, this is uncomfortable. And then you do that and you're like, okay, look, wow, my life hasn't really changed. (laughs) The only thing that's changed is I feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to strengthen those courage muscles some more, some more, some more. But yeah, it's, I'm, you're so close to a breakthrough. Like you're so close, which is why you're like, oh my God, my life is going to blow up. (laughs) And then you take the action and you're like, really? Oh my gosh. Everything is the same. Like, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to put this book out into the world. I'm going to divulge all these things. I do it. And everyone's like, Hey, did your book launch yet? (laughs) And I'm like, nobody cares. Nobody cares. I I know. I know. I know. I know that feeling. I do. I do. And I think, you know, all right. So, so your, so your book though, your book, Dying to Be a Good Mother, I, I'm going to assume now in talking to you that the people, that those listening know some of your story because I want to get to the, I know it. So I want to get to my questions about it. <laughs> um, and you know what? If they don't, they can watch your TEDx. That gives a good, a little, right? A little snippet. And in that you talk about, you know, having cancer and it have, it gave you permission. Like I've suffered enough. I can now do what I want to do and and create the life that I want. What do I desire? What do I want? What do I crave? And, 
I, I've not been through that to that extent, but I remember at the beginning of the pandemic and quarantine and having those moments of when this is over, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And life just kind of has a way of going right back to where it was before all of that. Like when you're, when I was in it, it was very intense. And I, and I wonder for you, how, how do you, what, like, how do you keep it tuned up? You know what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? Like, how do you not let yourself slip back and into those same habits that you were in before the, the big moments? Yeah. Um, yeah, it gave me, I mean, cancer saved my life. It gave me so much. And, but that wasn't (laughs) even the first, like, moment I had like mothering really kicked my ass like coming into motherhood <clears throat> you're like here it goes again I'm so excited for you to email me like in a few weeks and be like Heather I had my nervous breakdown <laughs> and my breakthrough and this is amazing oh my god I just like can't, I don't know how I just got through that sentence but I did and now I can't stop coughing for you to answer it because I, I want it. to know the answer so badly <laughs> okay so Answer. Right, no. I, yes. I felt like I was pushed back into a corner. Like I had a lot of fear and I was like, I have to go through this. I have to live and survive. And so my focus was survival. And it was like, failure was not an option. Failure was not an option. And the fear of the unknown was so big, right? The fear, but I just, I had to, I'm like, I just got to focus here And I know that I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, but I have to like believe that there is a tomorrow. And that's like that laser focus. Like that was a muscle that I built, but I don't apply that today. I mean, you get comfortable, right? We're in our pain. We're like, I'm going to change. I'm going to change next week. You're not in pain. And you're like, yeah, okay, here I am again. So to be honest, I have ebb and flow, ebb and flow, ebb and flow, but I purposely put myself in uncomfortable situations now. Like I know that I'm going to backslide. It's human nature Mm -hmm. and I'm very comfortable and I've achieved way more today in my health and every area of my life than I've ever thought possible for myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly like reinvesting in myself, putting myself in this container of space, surrounding people, like putting people around me that are like, you don't get to back out of this. <laughs> like the only way out is through. Mm-hmm. So when people are like, I just, I don't have the willpower. And I'm like, I don't either. I put myself in incredibly uncomfortable situations all the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, the only way out is through mm-hmm. to get me to that next level. Yeah. And is that a lot of what you're doing in your programs? Like you're, you're helping people through those, like, like, what does it look like to work with you? Yeah. So when I'm, so whether (laughs) like I have two main programs, one's mastery and one's mastery business. So mastery is like the personal side of people. Like what's the fulfillment? What does that look like? Like the, like feeling on purpose, living on purpose, like the emotional intelligence piece, the time management piece. And then Mm -hmm. the business side is that plus how do I make money now? Like I'm Mm -hmm. doing all the things. How do I make money now? Which money and worth so connected. Yeah. Like if you don't value yourself and your worth, you're going to be like, people won't pay me that they will. You're just not owning it. So it's so connected. Um, but yeah, it's a large investment. They say, yes, what's your vision? And I'm always like, what do you want? Okay. You know what you don't want. What do you want? Like, let's, it doesn't have to be a perfect vision. Let's start moving towards it. Mm -hmm. And then when all those things are coming up, we're working towards it and you're in that container of space. So you can't back out. Of course you could be like, I want to back out. And it's like, awesome. Why? And then you got to keep facing it and keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's it's a time commitment as well. It's not just, hey, let's chat for an hour. They're in it for weeks, if not months with you. Yeah, I mean, we do have smaller programs that are two months, but usually they're eight to 10 months. Mm -hmm. Um, But the funny thing is about the time commitment, people think this takes a long time. (coughs) And if you actually allot your time, you do things in 15-minute increments consistently. So Mm -hmm. the reason why we have a longer period of time 
is because when you're doing small things consistently over time, it creates transformation, which is the complete opposite of what people want to buy into. They want to buy into short amount of time, pressure, Mm -hmm. pain, suffering. And then when those, that support is no longer there, they fall back into old patterns. And I want people to say, even if we get another pandemic or shutdown, I got this. That's, that's true transformation. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. It, yes. Cause we want the instant gratification, but it's not, it's not what sticks. Yeah. It has to be integrated all the way through. 100%. Given the pandemic, what, what have you learned about yourself in this time over the last two years? Um, to be honest, when it first happened, I had deja vu of like when I was going through treatment Mm. and I was like, I've been here before. Mm. And I actually felt extremely alone because I'm like, now the world is going to know what I felt. And I'm like, I have eight years on people. And I, I was like, I just remember feeling so like I was in a crisis state or emotion or survival mode in so many areas of my life when I was diagnosed that when I did so much work in all areas of my life to get into a thrival state mm-hmm. so that when COVID happened, not only was I mentally, physically, emotionally, financially prepared, that when that stress was happening and that like, you know, chaos or the kids were out of school because we were homeschooling for a year It just, it took a little bit out of the cups. You know, those buckets were slowing down, but there was no crisis. There was no survival mode. And I just keep telling people, stop trying to pretend things are going back to normal. (laughs) And don't just hold your breath and wait for the clouds to part. You're waiting for something outside of you. Pay attention to what is not sustainable in your life Mm. and fix that. So if it was your income, be like, I can't just live paycheck to paycheck anymore. I have to have more for emergency funds. Mm. If it's, you know, if it's Mm. the relationships, like it's, yeah, it was an overhaul, but honestly it has taught me, it's been so much confirmation and, um, I think just giving myself more permission that if something does not serve me, I don't need to say yes to it. Like people, events, all of that. Yeah. What's something that, that you're working on that you want to improve on yourself? Lots of things. (laughs) People don't believe me when I say that because they see a different version of me than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say it's, doing, um, it's the habits in the areas that I don't want that I don't yet identify. So movement, Mm -hmm. um, the food, you know, just like feeling more creative, um, compassion. Like, although I like legit teach compassion and connection, we teach what we need to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I get very triggered. Like my go-to emotion is anger. And I don't do that with my kids, but I'll do that with like, you know, other people. And they don't know I'm angry. I'm Mm -hmm. like, why why did I just go right there? Why can't I just be more compassionate? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I think because I still need to, you know, there's a part of myself I need to be more compassionate with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It always comes back to the self, really. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, well, if I do it to myself, then I'm nicer to other people. So yeah, I think it's the habit formation for sure. And definitely not beating myself up because I, I see it. I want to be there already. And so I'm like, look how far you've come. Mm -hmm. You will get there. Be patient Mm -hmm. and just take, do the work you need to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And we've talked a lot about this in Not so directly, but I'm going to ask you about, you know, what comes to mind for you when I say self-care, like as, as part of your work, Mm -hmm. you know, because I have an issue with this word, this terminology. Yeah. I try not to even use it a lot um, because the belief in conversation around self-care is selfish. And to me, self-care is free. Like it shouldn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. Um, it's about, you know, it goes back to like 
how do I want to feel? And what do I need? Do I need a glass of water? Do I need a bath? Do I need to go for a walk? Do I need to like not respond? How about self care of not feeling guilty that my friend texted me yesterday and I haven't responded back today and I read it and I'm still thinking about it. And Mm I am like, Oh, I mean, I didn't respond back. She's going to think I'm avoiding her. And I'm like, no, I just didn't make it a priority. I don't have the capacity and self care is just taking yourself off the hook for those types of things and saying, kids, I love you deeply. And somehow you picked me to be your mom (laughs) and I'm sorry, but it's beans and rice again. (laughs) (laughs) Like just taking your, like being you, like what feels like me, you know, Mm -hmm. like lately I've been thinking a lot about creativity and that's something that I, I apparently I've always been a creative person, but I haven't identified as one. So I'm like, you know, just what do I want? What do I crave? What does that look like? Maybe I can take an art class that has nothing to do with business, nothing to do with parenting. My kids don't have to come to the art class with me. Mm-hmm. Like just giving yourself permission to be like, what do I want to explore? And even if you're just listening to a podcast on that topic or reading a book, like just Dang, we put way too much pressure on ourselves and overcomplicate everything. Yeah, yeah. All right, and I, I just lastly want to ask you, in the work that you do in your in your coaching programs, does any overarching theme or any anything really ever surprise you, catch you off guard? At this point, not much catches me off guard because I've been at it for a while. A long time, yeah. Um, but I will say what I thought I was teaching women and what I'm actually teaching them are two different things. And I didn't understand that until I asked them what, what they learned on the other side, whether it was in parenting, business, a relationship. And they said, I learned to trust myself, Hmm. trust my desires, trust what I needed trust myself to say yes, trust myself to say no, trust that I knew what to do in an uncomfortable moment, Mm -hmm. Um, deep Mm self-trust. What did you think you were teaching them? Well, they would tell me like, how do I get my child to listen to me? Oh. And then I I was like, oh, this is how you get your children to listen to you. Like (laughs) you really got to listen to yourself. And then in business, same thing. Like, how do I, how do I attract my ideal client? How do I, you know, I talk a lot about sales and it comes back to the same thing is like compassion and deeply listening to somebody. And how do you attract your ideal client? Well, you have to let yourself be seen. Mm -hmm. Like, do you trust yourself? Do you think you're even good enough to be Mm -hmm. seen? Like it all comes back to the self. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Heather, I'm sure there are a thousand things, but is there any one thing that you would have asked yourself that I didn't think to, or any final thoughts that you have based on, on, on how this, I don't even know what you would call this. Would you still call it an interview? <laughs> it's a, we need to, we need to come up with a new word. That's like a uh, interview sesh, like interview sesh. Session. Yes. Yeah. Interview <laughs> sesh. Um, oh my God. <laughs> inner, inner, I want to say like interview therapy or something. <laughs> yes. Um, I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. I don't think there's anything I would ask. Some people ask me, like, what's the one thing? And I'm like, listen, how it's it. We got here believing one thing that Mm -hmm. self-care is selfish, that putting yourself last is good mothering. How about we just try the opposite on (laughs) and see what happens? Like Mm -hmm. actually put yourself on your to-do list and, um, For me, it's like, I truly believe that the more alive you are in your work, in your body, in your mind, like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm lit up. Like, yeah, you may not have gotten great sleep last night, but you have a plan to get great sleep this weekend Mm -hmm. or like, it's never going to be perfect, but the better you feel, that's literally the secret (laughs) that everybody is searching for. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Heather, thank you. And uh, it's like literally so embarrassing. But, I, you have no idea 
how much joy you have brought me because <laughs> this is vulnerability and which is why it feels embarrassing, but this is vulnerability and that is <laughs> What creates connection? And that is exactly what these ladies need to hear because yeah. they're over there saying, can I just have a quick tip or strategy? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you want to know the strategy? Be honest with yourself. I know. So, I know. Well, I, I know. Because I, I've, I've searched for the strategies or the – it's like everything now is a life hack. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to hack anything. I just yeah. want to like – I just want to not be tired anymore, you know? Anyway, yeah. when All people right. are done with the hacks, they they come to me. They're like, "I'm done. Yeah. I'm not searching for a secret." Yeah. Like, you know, I'm like, "Let's do the work. Let's yeah. do the emotionally uncomfortable work." I know. All right. Well, thank you, thank you. This was interesting, but overall amazing. I appreciate you. No problem. All right. Have a good day. There it is. You just listened to the Emotionally Uncomfortable podcast. If you want to take this conversation to the next level, head on over to our private Facebook group community, heatherchauvin.com forward slash Facebook. My last name is spelled C-H-A-U-V-I-N. That's heatherchauvin.com forward slash Facebook. Also, if you are a huge fan of this show, please rate and review it on iTunes. Every review helps another woman like you take back control of how she wants to feel and become emotionally uncomfortable. I truly believe the better we feel, the more alive we become, this is how we are going to change the world. And if you've been watching me for a while, if you've been on the fence and you're curious, how can Heather help me? Head on over to heatherchauvin.com forward slash work with me to check out my mastery and mastery business coaching programs. That's heatherchauvin.com forward slash work with me.